of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today is Communion Saturday. For those here, you should have grabbed your communion, little communion cup on the way in. For those who are joining us online, you have time right now to prepare, to grab uh, some bread, to grab your cup in preparation for communion. Communion is a time to remember the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has accomplished all that we need, all of our hope, all of our peace, all of our joy, all in Christ. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Would you stand with us as we begin, as Akin reads for us Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. Ho, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Let us sing to the rock of our salvation. the glory for all he has done praise to the father who gave us his son a ransom for many he bled and died then rose in victory enthroned on glory in heaven and earth all of creation is shouting his word the saints and the angels all live to proclaim the wonderful story the glorious name
First Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. What hope we have in Christ that God is with us. He hears us. He sees us. He knows everything that we're going through. Our hope is truly built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Veils his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand.
is the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand seated. Jesus has called his followers to regularly come together and remember his death on the cross, which pays for the sins of all who trust him. We take the bread, which is a picture of his broken body, and we take the cup, which is a picture of his shed blood. 
And by eating the bread, drinking the cup, we remember what our Savior has done for us. No one gets saved by eating the bread, drinking the cup. We're saved from our sins because Jesus paid for our sins on the cross and because we're trusting him. But eating the bread and drinking the cup is a powerful picture. It helps us to remember, remember what Jesus has done. So if you're trusting Jesus Christ this morning, this is for you, to remember and to receive. Communion is not for sinless people, I like to say, because not one of us is. Communion is for sinful people, like me and like you, who who are trusting Jesus Christ to forgive them, to change them, to fill them, to satisfy them. So welcome, sinful people who are trusting Jesus. Here we are. And as we come and remember Jesus' death, prayerfully with our trust in him, remembering our hearts on him, he will come. The spirit of Jesus Christ will come and will touch us and give us exactly what we need this morning. Maybe it's fresh assurance of forgiveness. Maybe it's a a stirring of, of your heart. You've been lukewarm lately. Maybe he'll stir that. Maybe it's conviction over an area of sin that you've been blind to. Maybe it's strength against some temptation or comfort in the midst of a trial or suffering you're experiencing. Whatever we need as we come, he will meet us and give us exactly what we need this morning. So let's pray together and ask him to do that. We love you, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We want to remember what you did for us. And we ask, Lord, that as we set our hearts upon you and take the bread and take the cup, that you would come, pour out your spirit upon us. Give us exactly what we need this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take the bread. This is the top part. This is not easy, so we'll give you some time here. But just hold it in your hand. Jesus said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you, for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and partake. Let's take the cup. That's the next part here. Don't spill, though. Okay. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant. The new covenant. All the covenant, new covenant blessings purchased through his death. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's go ahead and partake. Let's just worship with that last chorus that we sang there. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's precious. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We worship you, Jesus Christ. 
There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. You are the Savior. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but through you. We praise you. Just as Don read earlier, you suffered the righteous for the unrighteous that you might bring us to God. We can come to know you, to know the Father through your death on the cross, and we worship you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Okay, well, welcome to Grace Church. So is my mic, do I need to do something with my mic? Am I making a lot of noise up here? It sound, at least you can hear me. Okay, good. Uh, big welcome to you. Isn't it a privilege? We appreciate it more and more after this, last, this COVID, COVID season we've been in, but what a privilege to meet with each other face to face, to see flesh and blood believers. So welcome, all those of you here, here this morning. Children, we're so glad you can be part of the service. Uh, those who are part of us with live stream this morning, welcome. May the Lord just fill your home there with his presence. And then those who, of you who are watching next Friday morning, may the Lord bless you richly there too, but it's good that we can be together to worship. I want to mention that after the service today, we're going to be having what we call a church out to lunch at Alwata Mall, which is W-A-H-D-A, I believe. Is that right? Okay, W-A-H, put that in your Google Maps. It'll take you there about five, 10 minutes away. Great time to connect with people you maybe haven't talked with for a while, meet new friends. If you are new or relatively new to Grace Church, please come join us. And those of you who are regulars, welcome new people in. We'll be, again, social distancing, four people at a table, um, but we can welcome people into that. And it'll be a good time for us to connect with old friends, make new friends, and celebrate the Lord together. So that's right after the service today. Now let's pray for, for the message, for the sermon, for the word of God to impact us. Lord, we pray that your word would be today a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, that we would see more clearly the path you're calling us to walk on, especially the path to devote time to praying for your work in the church and through the church, that you'd strengthen us to see that part of the path more clearly with more understanding today because of Psalm 44. And I pray that you'd help me, Lord, to be faithful to the scriptures. Give me the wisdom that I need. Give me the heart that I need, God, I pray. And would you come and continue to mold and shape Grace Church to be the church you want us to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you become a follower of Jesus, when God through Jesus saves you, you receive just amazing gifts. Let me just mention a couple of them. You receive, as we've celebrated with communion, forgiveness for all your sins. You receive a heartfelt relationship with God, your Father. What, what a gift. You receive a joy in knowing Jesus that completely fills you, strengthens you through trials, satisfies you, overflows from you to bless others. And, and you receive a life that is full of meaning and purpose and significance. Now, that last one is important because we all crave to have lives that count, that matter, that make a difference. We all long for that. And one way that God gives amazing meaning and significance into our lives is that he has chosen to use our prayers to accomplish his purpose in the world. And what a mercy. God doesn't need our prayers. It's not like if we pray enough that he's strong enough. No, 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 no. He doesn't need our prayers at all. But as a gift to us, he has chosen to use our prayers, our weak prayers, our undeserving prayers, right? He's chosen to use our prayers to accomplish his 
purpose in this world. So just let this sink in. He's, he's chosen to use your prayers to advance the gospel in the world, to push back Satan's kingdom, to strengthen and revive the church, to plant churches, to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Your prayers, he's chosen, will have that significance, that importance, that meaning. Let me give you an illustration. In 1858, there were very few believers in the town of Banbridge, Ireland. Irish people here, okay. Very few believers. 1858, the town of Banbridge. But one night, a few of them got together to pray for their town. And so they prayed. And someone who was there at that meeting wrote this down later, said, The Lord was among us that evening. And we all seemed to feel his presence in an unusual way. And toward the end of that meeting, someone brought a word of prophecy that God had heard their prayers and that he was going to do a mighty work in their town. So they continued to pray over the next days and weeks and months without seeing much happening. But then, all of a sudden... Hardened unbelievers, hardened unbelievers had their hearts melt when they heard the good news of Jesus, weeping, crying out to Jesus to forgive them. Many in the town, just you, they saw them in the town, weeping over their sins, crying out to Jesus to forgive them and to change them. There were entire families who had no believers. Any member of the family was, was trusting Christ. Whole families came to trust Christ together. Over 20 prostitutes all came to Christ together, and the church just welcomed them in and cared for them. The town of Banbridge, Ireland, was transformed. Now, imagine that you were one of those believers who met that night and who gave yourself hours through those weeks and months. Lord, meet our town. Fill this town with the gospel. Pour out your spirit upon us. What a gift that God would have given you in allowing you to have a hand in what he did in that town. Think of the joy, the delight, the pleasure that you'd feel in knowing that God had used you in that way. And that's what God intends for each of us. He's chosen to use our prayers. So let's say that this week you wanted to set aside some time to pray for God's work in the church and through the church here in Abu Dhabi, Grace Church, all the, all the Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching churches here. Here in Abu Dhabi, here in the UAE, here in this region, maybe in your home country. You wanted to give a chunk of time to pray for God's work in and through the church. How would you pray? Where would you start? What would you say? God has told us in the Bible, and one of the passages is Psalm chapter 44. Let's turn there. An amazing psalm. And when you study the psalm, you see that it breaks down into four sections. And each section gives us a step to take as we pray and ask God to work in the church and through the church. Let's start with verses 1 through 3, which gives us the first step. Praise God. Take time to praise God for what he's done in past history. Verse 1. The psalmist writes, it's to the choir master, a maskil, we aren't exactly sure what that is, it might be some kind of musical arrangement, a maskil of the sons of Korah. So the sons of Korah wrote this psalm. And here's how it begins. O oh God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. So see, he's, He's praising God for what God has done in past history, in the days of old. Verse 2, you with your own hand drove out the nations, but them, your people, the people of Israel, you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them, the people of Israel, you set free. So what the psalmist is talking about here is how God had promised the people of Israel, remember, a land flowing with milk and honey. Promised them that. 
a land where they could dwell safely, securely, a land where they could shine the glory of Jesus and speak of the glory of Jesus to the nations around them, a land where the Messiah would be born, who would save us from our sins. God had promised them this land flowing with milk and honey. But the problem was that there were nations already there, terribly wicked nations, and God said, I'm going to bring my judgment upon them for their sin. I'm going to drive them out, and the land is going to be mercifully given to you, Israel. So keep going in verse 3. For not by their own sword, wasn't Israel's own sword, did they win the land, nor did their own arms save them, but your right hand and your arm, Lord God, and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. So the psalmist is recounting what God had done in giving the people the promised land. And this stirs the psalmist then to pray in verse 4, You are my king, O God. Ordain salvation. Ordain salvation for Jacob. In other words, God, I've heard what you've done with amazing power in times past. This has stirred my faith to ask you to work more today, even more today. That's verse 4. And I would encourage you this week, you choose to take some time to pray for God's work in the church and through the church, take time to praise God for what he's done in past history. Like, here's some of the things I thought I might, we all have different things that are in our minds. Here's some of the ones that were in my mind as I thought about this. We could praise God for spreading the gospel throughout not just the Mediterranean region, but the whole Roman Empire in the first century from just a few believers, 120 in the book of Acts chapter 1, spread throughout the Mediterranean basin in the Roman Empire. We could praise God for raising up Martin Luther, who brought about the Protestant Reformation and brought thousands of people back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God for raising up the German Moravians. You maybe have never heard of them, but I I love them. In the 1700s, under the leadership of Count Zinzendorf, they met together regularly to pray, especially for missions, and God used them to send hundreds of missionaries out into the world the German Moravians. So just start to go through what God has done in church history. And when you do this, how will it affect you? It'll strengthen your faith. Look at what God has done in the past. Oh Lord, come and work today. Move with power today. Look at what you've done in the past. We need your power. We need your help. Come and pour out your grace upon us in similar and even greater ways today. Second step. In verses 5 through 8, praise God for what he's done in our lifetimes. So the first step involved praising him for past history, but it's also good to reflect about in your lifetime, what have you seen God do? Notice in verses 5 through 8, the psalmist emphasizes that it was God, not the people of Israel, who accomplished these recent victories they'd experienced. Verse 5, through you, God, we push down our foes. Through your name, we tread down those who rise up against us. Notice, this isn't past. This is in his lifetime. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me, but you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God, we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. Selah. And we've talked about how Selah is like probably a musical interlude there, an instrumental section, so they can just let that sink in. Yes, we've boasted in you, God, continually. Yes, we will give thanks to your name forever. So there you are. You're wanting to pray for God's work in the church and through the church, and you want to take time to praise God for what he's done in your lifetime. So here's some of the things that I, I listed. I might praise God for raising up Billy Graham, who led thousands and thousands of people to the Lord. I had the privilege of going to a couple of his um, evangelistic crusades. It's amazing. I, I would praise God for the whole Jesus people movement, 1970s. I mean, that's when I met the Lord. But there were thousands of people, young people especially, who came to faith and hundreds of churches planted through that season. We might praise God for spreading the gospel through China in these last, like, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, amazing. I mean, millions of people coming to faith in Christ and God strengthening them, many of them, through terrible suffering and persecution, which continues today. 
So see, as we praise God again for how he's done mighty works that we've heard of in our lifetimes, that will strengthen our faith. Lord, this is what you do. You work in these amazing ways. You pour out your spirit. You save thousands of people. You strengthen believers for suffering. Lord, do it again and more, we pray. Third step, verses 9 through 22. This is a long section. We're taught to tell God about the needs of the church. Now, at the time that this psalm was written, God's people were suffering terribly. In their lifetimes, they'd seen God work in amazing ways. That has changed, though, now. They are suffering terribly. And the author knows that God is sovereign over everything. He could have stopped them from suffering. Easy, no problem. But he's allowed them to go through this suffering, which is why the author says that God is ultimately behind all of this. These are hard verses to read. But look at what the psalmist says. Start with verse 9. But... And you've worked in past history powerfully. You've worked in our lives powerfully. But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. Now, he's not saying that God has completely rejected his people. God never does that. I will never leave you or forsake you is the promise. It's absolutely true. But God has not gone out with them into battle. God has continued to love and comfort them, but God has not gone out with them into battle. God has allowed them to be defeated. Verse 10, you've made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us have gotten spoil. You've made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. Do you see how he's recounting to God the, the needs that are there amongst God's people? You've sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You've made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You've made us a byword among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. All day long, my disgrace is before me, and shame has covered my face at the sound of the taunter and reviler at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. Now, this, this is shocking, isn't it, when you first read it? Absolutely shocking. God allowed his people to be defeated and captured and taken away as slaves, like sheep to the slaughter? Why? Why would God do that? Now, we might think it's because the people had sinned. There are lots of times in the Old Testament where God's people had sinned, turned to idols, unrepentant, unconfessed idol worship. And God, in his love and mercy, allowed people to conquer them, to wake them up. This is what you're doing. This is the implications of the steps you're taking. Wake up, turn back to me. I'll deliver you. So is this because of the people's sin? Is that why God had done this? Not this time. It was not because of their sin. In verses 17 through 22, we read that God's people had been faithful to him, trusting him, obeying him. Not that they'd been sinless, right? No one is sinless this side of heaven. But when they sinned, they confessed, they repented, they turned back to God. They'd been faithful to God. Look at verse 17. All this has come upon us, the defeat, the oppression, the slaughter. All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you. And we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back. And I think the psalmist maybe is weeping as he's writing this part here. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals, and you've covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake, it's because of our devotion to you that we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. God's people had been faithful to him. They'd loved him, trusted him, obeyed him. And yet God had allowed them to be defeated. Why? 
Why? This is a crucial question for us to think about, church. Because I would guess that some of you think that the way it works is that the more you trust Jesus, the less trials you'll have. We think, well, the more I trust Jesus, then the less trials. Trust grows, trials, suffering shrink. That's not what the Bible teaches. And if you think that is what the Bible teaches, then you will have times where you are struggling to understand and and disillusioned. It's not what the Bible teaches. One reason we know that is because of Psalm 44. We're reading it right here this morning. Another reason is because Paul takes verse 22, and he quotes it in Romans chapter 8. And I want us to read it in the context of the verses that Paul writes so that we can see Paul takes that verse, for your sake we are killed all the day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered, and he quotes it in Romans 8. So let's look at Romans 8, verses 35, 36, and 37. This will help us understand what God is doing and why. Verse 35, Romans 8, verse 35. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. So he's asking, can suffering like this separate us from Christ? And his answer is, absolutely not. And then he explains, we will experience those things. That's the point of verse 36. That's the point of quoting verse 22 of chapter 44. We will experience those things. Verse 36, as it is written, For your sake, that is because of our faithfulness to you, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul is saying that verse to us, to every believer. For the sake of Jesus, God's people are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, let me just pause here and apply this to what tragedies we've heard happening in Afghanistan this past week. Heartbreaking to hear, right? I mean, I would sure that some of you have struggled as you've seen the videos, as you've heard the news reports, and you've thought, God, where are you? Why would you allow this to take place? What are you doing? Are you there? I would guess that some of you have struggled. But they shouldn't make us struggle. They should make us weep. Yes. Pray. Yes. But not struggle. Not struggle. Because the Bible is clear that God allows the people he loves deeply to struggle greatly. Not to struggle. To suffer greatly. Let me try that again. God allows the people he loves deeply to suffer greatly. It's all through the Bible. You've read it, right? And Paul quotes Psalm 44 to make this absolutely clear to his readers in Romans chapter 8. We will experience tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. For your sake, we're killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But this suffering will not separate us from the love of Christ because of what he says in verse 37. No, no. It won't separate us from the love of Christ. Rather, in all these things, all this suffering, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The reason we're more than conquerors when we suffer, like listed in verses 35 and 36, the reason we're more than conquerors is because when we suffer, Jesus will be moving right in towards us with everything that we need all the comfort that we need, all the strength that we need, all the peace that we need, all the wisdom that we need. And he will so fill us with his presence at that time that we will shine with his reality and with his glory and to shine with the reality and glory of Jesus Christ amongst opposition, people who don't trust him, to shine forth with Jesus' glory in that way is one of the greatest joys a human being can ever experience. Now, you might think, 
I don't think if I was in Afghanistan, I'd be shining with Jesus reality and joy. I, I think I'd be scared to death and, and running. And, and I get it. But let me explain it like this. The reason you don't feel now like you could be strong in Afghanistan is because you're not in Afghanistan. God's giving you the grace to do what you need to do right here this Saturday morning in Abu Dhabi. If he called you to be in Afghanistan, he would give you all the grace and more that you needed to shine for him in Afghanistan. That's what he's promised. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll give you everything that you need. Here's an example. In the 1500s, 45-year-old John Bradford and 19-year-old John Leaf, John Bradford, John Leaf, were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the streets of England. And they were arrested and condemned to be burned at the stake. That's what was going on in England at the time. And someone wrote down what John Bradford said to John Leaf as they were being tied to the stake. Here's what John Bradford said. Be of good comfort, brother, for we shall have a merry supper with the Lord tonight. Mm. Love that. Shining. The confidence, the power, the peace, the joy of Jesus just shining forth to those who were tormenting and going to kill them. They were more than conquerors in that setting. Suffering does not separate us from the love of Christ. Suffering brings the love of Christ. That's why Paul could say about his thorn in the flesh, I boast in my weaknesses because when I'm weak in myself, I'm strong in Christ. Bring more of your strength. More than conquerors. More than conquerors. Jesus comforts and fills his sheep who are slaughtered. And every one of us will bow at his feet when we see him in heaven and say, thank you for the suffering, for the privilege of displaying your glory, and for meeting me in that setting. It's a gift. Philippians 1.29, for Christ's sake it has been granted to us, granted to us, for Christ's sake it has been granted to us, not only to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. It's a gift for the sake of more of Christ. Now, with all that in mind, back to Psalm 44.22. That, that was a big detour, okay? I think it's an important detour. Back to the topic at hand, how do we pray for God to work in the church and through the church. Psalm 44, 22, yet for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. The point is God's people here were not suffering because of their sin. They were suffering because of their faith, because of their devotion to him. So here's our takeaway from this third point, long third point, but let's pull back in here. Tell God about the needs that you're seeing in the church. Tell God about the needs. Sometimes those needs will not be caused by any sin as in Psalm 44. Sometimes they will be caused by sin. Acknowledge that. Sometimes you won't know. Okay, that's not the most important part. The important part is to tell God about the needs that you're seeing, the needs that you're feeling in the church and in the area that the church can, can minister to. Now, why should we bother telling God about the needs that we're seeing in the church and around the church when God already knows all those needs? He already knows them, right? He knows everything, far better than any of us does. So why tell God about these needs? I thought of three reasons. You could maybe think of some more, but here's three that I think, three ways this would help me to pray. One, I think it would deepen my concern about these needs. I mean, to pray about Afghanistan. Father, think about the women that are, are there, what this is going to mean for them, and the, the house church pastors that, that have been warned. And, oh, Lord, to, to, to detail that before the Lord will help me feel even greater concern. I think it'll strengthen my faith to know, God, you know about these needs now. You who has all power, you know about all of these needs as I'm recounting them to him. And I think it would motivate me to pray even more, to go over the needs, just stir me to pray. That This is why I'm praying right now. That's right. So I think that recounting to God 
the needs that we're seeing will strengthen us in our prayer. So, for example, this week, you could take a chunk of time to pray uh, for, the, for the sufferings of the people in Afghanistan. Recount to God all that you've seen, what you've known, and ask him, God, have mercy. Thwart the plans of the Taliban. Work with power. Help, Lord. Pray about the sufferings of the church in Afghanistan, the believers that are there who are fearful, who aren't sure that they can stand for the Lord in the midst of this difficulty. Pray about churches you know of, maybe in your home country, maybe here or around, who, who, who are, are not as strong in the Bible as they need to be. Lord, there's churches that are drifting from the Bible. Look, help. Maybe you know about believers who are not sharing their faith. Maybe they're just sinking into sin. Maybe they're suffering and, and, and having a difficult time. Share about the needs of believers that you know in our church and churches, churches around. We could pray about how we need more strong Hindi, Urdu, Bible-preaching churches. Right, brothers? We need more. And Arabic-speaking churches in this city. You could pray for the church in North Korea. Oh, which brothers and sisters, they've been suffering for decades, the believers there. Pray for them. Pray for believers who need to be revived in their faith. Pray for churches who need to be united together, who need to be cleansed from sin. Pray for believers who are timid, who need to be emboldened. Father, here's what's going on. I want to pray for these. I want to mention these needs. Let me give you one more example. Wales, 1860s. I was reading a book about Ireland and Wales, okay? Wales, 1860s. Glamorganshire. Okay, do you know where that is? It was an area that was full of sin, full of unbelief, with just a few small, struggling churches. But God's people committed to pray. Pray for that area, Glamorganshire. They prayed. For an outpouring of God's Spirit, and for, for eight months they prayed. Gave chunks of time to, to crying out for the church to be revived and for the gospel to spread. And then, all of a sudden, prayers were answered. Dozens of people in church services suddenly started just being convicted for their sin, crying out. They, they thought they were saved, seeing that they were not saved at all, and crying out, put their trust in Jesus and were saved. Believers started to meet together, to pray, to encourage each other in the scriptures, in smaller settings. The parts of the county that were the darkest spiritually were the most powerfully impacted by the gospel and people coming to faith in Christ. And in a short time, many of the churches doubled in size, and there was just this stream of believers coming to faith in Jesus Christ in Glamorganshire. God has called us to the work of prayer. Grace Church, he's called you to the work of prayer. One of the most meaningful, significant activities you can do as a human being that he has chosen to use your prayers to bring his purposes into Abu Dhabi, this region, your home country. And throughout church history, when believers have prayed, labored in prayer for their churches, their cities, their region, their, their countries, God has worked with great power. You see it throughout church history displayed. So, Grace Church, we are living in one of the least reached cities in the world here, one of the least reached cities, we are surrounded by people, the vast majority of whom have never heard the gospel. Here we are. So here's what I want to call you to do. Make it a priority. Don't, don't waste your time here. Make, make part of your time here prayer. Laboring in prayer for Abu Dhabi, be filled with the gospel, for the, the churches that love Jesus here. Lord, bless Cornerstone Church and ECC and New Life Church and All Nations Church, the Nigerian Church. There's, there's a, Lord, those churches that are naming your name, bless them, pour out your spirit. God, fill the city with the gospel. Let's make it a priority to pray for God to work in the church here and through the church here. And then let's watch and see what God does, because he's promised everyone who asks receives. That's what our Lord said. Let's stand together and pray. <laughs> Father,
Father, I pray that you would use Psalm 44 to stir in our hearts right now the privilege, the honor of being called to pray, that you would choose to use our prayers to bring your purposes into this city, into this region, into this world. And I pray, Lord, that this week we would turn over a new leaf and start putting some time into laboring in prayer for your work in the church and through the church, for our joy in seeing you glorified and for your glory being spread. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, let's respond by singing of the worthiness of our God. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Let me speak a benediction over us from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory, the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord bless you, Grace Church.